Hello, my friends. It's David Alt, and I'm so happy to welcome you to The Gathering. I hope that at whatever time, space, location that you are listening to this, that you give yourself this gift of tapping into the energy of willingness. It is in that energy that we are able to listen with fresh ears, to receive with an open heart. And may the meditations of my heart and the words from my mouth find a place within you that both comforts and inspires. I was working with someone a few weeks ago, and they uh, told me a remarkable story that I wanted to share with you. So this person, um, professional person, had lived in a home for, I'm going to, I believe it was close to 15 years. They had done a lot of things culturally that they felt that they were supposed to do for family members um, and found themselves then alone in this same house, going through a routine of work, had retired from that routine and was still going through the daily processes of living in this home until they found themselves in a situation that was dire. It was a financial situation. It felt inescapable. It felt almost like an avalanche had suddenly compounded all of a, a sense of desperation that they were going to have to make some changes and move out of this house. And it was never an intent for them to put the house on the market, but that's where all of these things that had built up put them. And the day came for a realtor to show the house. And so this person had to leave uh, for a few hours so that this showing could happen. And then they came back after the showing. And they told me that when they walked into their home, there was a moment where they thought perhaps that they had walked into the wrong place because suddenly there was this whole different perspective. There was light. There was um, the ability to see the things that were in the home from a completely different perspective. Now, granted, member, they've been there for probably 15 years. And then this is what they said to me. What was different was that the realtor had opened the drapes. That's it. The realtor had opened the drapes and they shared with me that it had never dawned on them to open the drapes for the entire 15 years that they had lived in this home. They had even sequestered themselves into a couple of spaces and the rest of the house had pretty much been neglected or unvisited. But the fact that the realtor did one simple thing of opening and then allowing the natural light to come in gave them a completely different perspective about the place that they had lived in for 15 years. Well, needless to say, that prompted a lot of discussion. And when that session was over, I could not help but sit in the profundity of that, in the, in the uh, surprise of that. And yet, as I continue to think about it, this is not an exception. This is not just a very kind of minute behavior because all of us, all of us, have a segmented part of our behavior or our consciousness where the drapes have continued to be closed. And so what is it then that is the intervening force, the intervention that brings about the circumstance where the drapes are opened and we are able to see our situation our lives, our geography, whatever it is that is in front of us in the now moment, we are able to see it from a different perspective. And that's what I want to talk to you today about. What is it that causes those drapes to be opened? 
So I think that we can all get on board with the concept, conceptual idea, that everything is not as it seems. That there is more to the activity of the, the form that is before us than meets the physical eye. I think that we can all sort of nod our heads in agreement with that. But to move beyond just the intellectual to opening the drapes, exploring and feeling that beyond just concept is an entirely different thing. And why this is so important, I feel, is that many of you who are watching this call yourselves or subscribe to being spiritual or being on a spiritual path. And on this spiritual path, there is a fundamental principle that we continue to talk about. And that is the principle that God, source, intelligence, is all that there is. This is the thing that we continue to focus and speak about and pray about and teach about. But can you understand that we can do this from an atmosphere of the drapes being closed? In other words, it's kind of more entertainment or it's more confined in the realm of something that we hope for rather than really, truly experience. And so I'm going to share with you, and I've talked about this many times, that that was kind of my life. Um, in uh, my, my partner was telling me that in the recovery programs, they talk about the, uh, the difference between the sort of uh, intellectual classroom process and the mountaintop process. So that mountaintop process is that thing where, where there is a just a sensational, mystical mind-blowing, perception-cleaning experience that just changes everything. And then there is the slow sort of processional that happens time after time with the willingness to continue to just show up and do the work. But it's not a, it's not a blow-the-roof top kind of experience. And so I, I confess that much of my life and much of my spiritual saturation and participation was more in the intellectual gradual building blocks. Um, I was talking to a, a fellow author and we were laughing at how we go back and we read old material. Or I was sharing with her as well that when I listen to myself, from years and years and years ago, giving a, a Sunday talk, that sometimes I find myself cringing because I am aware that what I am saying in that moment is a snapshot of that particular level of consciousness or that particular level of self-awareness and that where I am now is completely different. And we talked about the importance the, the value or the importance of we have to honor that material even though it's not indicative of where we are today. And that people perhaps who will come across that will receive the value that they need to receive. But still for us, we go, oh my God, it's like I don't want anybody to listen to that or I don't want anybody to read that. So my process, I, I would equate to the fact that evidently my incarnation, my soul's path was the slow and steady. I had to, I had to arrive at the shore of spirituality from a place of pain and desperation. I had to arrive at a place where I was so in need of relief from religion, from indoctrination of being um, born of sin, if you will, that anything that was remotely different from that was like stumbling upon an oasis. And so it was very attractive, but it was also 
kind of more of the same, meaning that growing up in a fundamentalist background, we're doing whatever we can to seek approval. And then I arrive at a more metaphysical platform or a spiritual journey, and it can slowly morph into the same where I can take a doctrine like God is all that there is and then actually use that from an old paradigm to beat myself up that I'm not good enough because then I can compare my quote, quote, manifestations. I can compare my life's productivity to other people and I can become seduced in applying old behavior into what is supposed to be a new level of understanding or a new communion and relationship with God. It's not, it's not the universe's fault. It's not, quote, God's fault. It's the fact that I am slowly having to untangle myself from a very indoctrinated belief of duality or separation or not being good enough. And so I want to pause there because I want to make sure that you hear me because this is what I see so often. I, I see so many of us dragging our old duality into a, into let's call it a new costume. And it's attractive to us because we are still feeling the remnants of the hell state or the, the suffering. And we want anything to fix that. But we're still under the influence of an idea of duality or separation. So we come into metaphysics and we're like, ooh, I like that message. I like this message that I am enough. I like this message. And even though we like the message and we subscribe to it and we take the classes and we read the books, it still has not penetrated down into a deeper understanding of non-dualism or the idea that God is all that there is, including me. And I don't know how we all get there. I know for me, I got there after many decades of the saturation of that. And yet here's what changed everything. Here's what kind of uh, slow, and the opening of the drapes was, <laughs> You know, all of this was like the drapes were being slowly opened. They didn't, where the, whereas sometimes the mountaintop experience feels like the veil has been ripped apart and we see all of that. So for me, it was slower. And yet the, uh, the hunger for that light reached a point where I would say maybe about eight or nine years ago, where I desperately wanted to know why or how God could be all that there was. Because I found myself in a leadership role. I found myself with a label of being a minister. And I found myself having to battle with the atrocities of the world on a weekly basis and having people look at me saying, tell me how this can be. And so the pain of that, the responsibility of that sort of metaphorically drew me to my knees. And I finally said, all right, whatever that is, universally divine presence, perfect patterning, I really want you to show me how it is possible that God is all that there is in a world that is seemingly the opposite. So to me, that was a whole new level of intention. Intention, to me, has moved away from sort of this scientific, experimental, I'm in control sort of different, different costume of willpower to being an active surrender. To me, intention is active surrender, meaning I show up but I surrender my egoic willpower and manipulation. I show up 100% available 
but I let go of the how. I show up and I willingly lay down my need to control on an altar of transfiguration that is going to going to be the, the person in the driver's seat instead of me. That's a completely different approach to intention for me. Because I think intention is confused with ramped up willpower. It's not. And so with that intention, I can look back now and I can see how things led me to a shamanic experience, a, a plant medicine experience with ayahuasca that took me into the multidimensionality and, and the realms where it is understandable and I could see the perfection of God in all things. I could see how all of the perpetrators in my life story were actually divine beings assisting me. I could see all of that. I can't translate that to you. And I'm not saying that what I participated in is what you should participate in. But the point is, is that I don't know how we can teach spirituality and non-dualism from a dualistic framework unless somehow we throw the drapes open or that we convince people, not con convince is the wrong word, or that we exemplify to people what it's like to open the drapes. Because without that, the battling of our warring and our suffering and our worry and our story and our self-loathing and suffering in silence and wearing the masks and putting on a straight, uh, this kind of face and this kind of face becomes untenable. And at some point we collapse. We collapse. And it is in that collapse that we have no other, no other uh, process than to leave the home of our familiarity and come back and see that the drapes have been open. And so bottom line is the spirituality the 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 path of the of the the path of the reawakening the path of service the path of understanding and a connection to a higher power that path must have an understanding of non-dualism non-dualism meaning that there is only one reality, that there is only God. And there must be comfort in that. There must be a resolve in that that is not housed in the intellect, but is felt within the heart. And when it is felt within the heart and we can see the perfection and the divine design in all things, then, then we can be advocates that are, that are not promoting more of the suffering. It was Ram Das who said that the hippies uh, were the cause for the police and the police were the cause for the hippies. Meaning that when we become so indoctrinated in our forceful belief systems that we're going to fight against certain things, then the aggressive belief and the aggressive energy of that is the thing that promotes more of the thing that we're fighting against. I don't want to advocate that way. It doesn't mean that I slip. It doesn't mean that things like the Uvalde shooting doesn't rip my soul apart. And I don't think that there's anyone on the planet who doesn't have some type of just deep, deep call to see that that is not right. But if we don't apply a non-dual 
understanding or a willingness or a surrender, an intention that actively surrenders and says, show me what it is that I am to do in these situations instead of railing, solely railing against something and calling it the, you know, the other. I've got to find a way to take spirituality and to make it so real in me because the suffering will not cease. In this plane of form, that is a part of the yin-yang experience. That is what you and I signed up for. That is the soul's path. The soul's journey is to reach a point where we do understand and, and have the essence and the application of non-dualism in our hearts. That's why we're here. That's why we're going through all of this. And it is what this plane exemplifies over and over and over again until you and I have a taste, a consideration, a willingness to have the experience where the drapes are wide open. Yes, some people have a mountaintop experience and others like me have to plod through the classroom for the majority of our lives until we're so tired that the intention changes. And I no longer want to be clever. I no longer want to be popular. I no longer want to do it to fill an old need of not enoughness. But now I want to lead or teach or serve from a deeper experience which means that the suffering will continue in this plane of form and I'm there. I'm there ready and available to do what I can do in order to help people open their drapes, in order to bring some type of light in no matter what that can be. And I must continue to do that for myself. And so we are all in this together, but I... Uh, the bigger question is, is, I don't know how we can live a spiritual life. I don't know how we can maintain a spiritual community if we don't focus on the inescapable value of understanding what non-dualism is. And so we were talking about, my partner and I were talking about where do we begin? You know, it's like spirituality 101 all over again. Because at some point, people leave. You know, the, the, I, I was told early in my ministerial career that people arrive from two different energies. One is inspiration or desperation. And that they waffle back and forth. And if, they're, if the desperation gets met a little bit to where it's tolerable, if there's no deeper desire, then they leave. And then they come back when they're desperate again. And if they come because they're inspired, but the inspiration sort of taps out because we're not all continuing to evolve with beginner's mind and the understanding, you know, so you start to see that the well runs dry. And so... I can I can only uh, I can only work at the level of my willingness, and my willingness is show me how God is all that there is. Are you willing to ask that? Show me that God is all that there is, and then, as Emerson would say, we must get our bloated nothingness out of the way. We must become aware that a lot for many of us, myself that I was still costuming my old wounding and my old domestication of not being enough. And so how do I, how do I pacify that? Then I, let me move into this arena and try to be clever and cute and funny and, and to feed my enoughness when that, again, is just on the surface. It's not deep enough. And it comes to a, 
not maybe not a mountaintop experience, but a cliff's edge experience where I then must be willing to just fall, fall into the abyss of the no thingness so that I can understand the everythingness of God. The no thingness is I must give up my personality, my identity, my titles, my, my intellect, my cleverness, my brilliance, my sentimentality. I must turn all of that over into something that is going to bring a new state of accountability. And so the 101 curriculum, I think, is this. Am I willing to practice the the, the exercise of looking at everything that I term as wrong and say, I am that. I am that. Am I willing to look at history and man's inhumanity to man and say, I am that and own it? And I, I, I am surprised at how heated that makes people feel when they look at, let's say, the issues of slavery. And they say, well, that wasn't me. That was them. But non-dualism is saying, mm, mm -mm. We, have to, we have to look at all of those things and we have to say, I am that. I am that. We have to look at a shooter. We have to look at mental illness. We look, have to look at robbery. We have to look at deception. We have to look at all those things and say, I am that. I'm not separate from that. It's only one organism. And then in my sincere absolution of being willing to bring God into that, not to fix it. I don't have the capability of fixing it, but I do have the, the, the willingness to lay that level of participation and the unconsciousness of my being on an altar and say, I accept that I am a part of the, I accept my responsibility in this. Help me, help me advocate from that place. And that's where being a light bearer comes into play. That's where then I can meet systemic issues and not fan the flames of the division, but can accept my responsibility and humbly ask the question, what is mine to do here? And then to listen and to act accordingly. This is what is before us. Are we willing to say, I am that? Not just with the stuff that's pretty, not with the stuff that is just deemed spiritual, but with all of it, all of it. It is my mission to continue to open my drapes. It is my mission to help you continue to open your drapes and to not linger, to not linger in the oppression, but to become accustomed to lingering in the solution. And the way that we do that is through ownership. Ownership of the collective. Ownership of the collective unconsciousness. And then doing our personal work, our private work, our prayer work, our activism in a way that doesn't add to the division, but helps to love and to serve and to remember that God is all that there is. Many blessings, many blessings to you. May you have the call to walk about this earth and say, I am that. And to be a part of the overwhelming absolution and acceptance so that we can continue to promote healing. God bless.